Good evening, everyone. Let me test my sound is correct. I think it is. It is indeed good stuff. Um, my name is James. I'm the director of the Everloan. I'm a PE teacher of 20 years experience now. Wow. That's, um, that's a big number. Um, and I'm really looking forward to doing this session with you. A couple of uh, a couple of shout outs. First of all, there's lots of you in this evening. I don't know how many in total, but there's many, many, many of you. Uh, a couple of names sort of jumping out to me. Karen Davies, uh, British School of Brussels. Karen, I still owe you a return lunch. You bought me a beautiful lunch uh, earlier in the academic year in uh, in Brussels where we met. It was lovely. Met your family. You're a gentleman. I must, must return that favour at some point. Uh, we have Lee Regan is in. You've been, there's a lot recently, Lee. You must be getting bored of me. Lee, I think I'm right. Cardinal Vaughan, isn't it? Um, that, that you are from, Lee. I really appreciate you being here. Uh, we have... We also have uh, Javier Martin. Javier, well, I have a bit of a confession. Some of you have been on these, um, these sessions with us before. Sometimes Javier and I speak to one another in a bit of a, a foreign tongue. Javier is a proud Catalan man. And as effectively the partner of a proud Catalan woman, I happen to speak uh, Javier's uh, language. Hola, Javier. ¿Qué tal? Tope. And um, it's a bit of a guilty pleasure. I quite like foreign language. I quite enjoy it. It's one of my pastimes. And Catalan is the language we speak at home basically every day. I'm definitely not the best in our house at it. Both of my daughters speak better than I do, but I give it a go. But Javier, it's great to have you here. Ben Bingutz, come sempre. Um, just a couple of others. Uh, let's see, Hannah Mosley, remind myself. Valibrium, Hannah, I think, have I got that right? Brilliant to have you here. Thanks so much. And look, loads of others as well. I don't mean to pick on individuals and leave you out, forgive me, but there's quite a few of you. Now, I want to frame what this evening's session is about. Some of you have taken part already in the last sort of two weeks of webinars that I've been doing, and we've really started to address the, the sort of meat of what it means to practice and retrieve, what it means to interleave, and what it means to establish, establish kind of mastery models of learning. And some of what we're going to talk about tonight is broadly based on some of those ideas and premises that we've we've covered in those sessions so the first thing and this is by the way is going to lead to a really nice free giveaway i'm going to provide you imminently the first thing i want to do is i want to provide all of you with a link because it's to effectively a fuller version of kind of what i'm going to do first so this link i'm putting into the chat here is for the recording of practice webinar when i say practice webinar I mean a webinar we did all about practice there. It's in the chat. I'd really encourage you to, to click on that, open that in another tab somewhere and come back to that later because that's really going to flesh out a lot of what we do in this session, but this session specifically related to GCSE P theory. If you're interested in those principles, I really encourage you to go and have a look at that session. Secondly, and this is where I have the kind of honor of giving you what I hope is a really nice gift. Okay, guys? I would like to provide you with this. It's a link to an infographic that we made for this session. So please take a look at this, okay? I'll put it on the screen for you as well, but it's gonna be something which is gonna, I believe is gonna be a real nice reservoir of information for you to come back to at the end of what we do this evening. So I'll put it up on the screen for you, but by all means go and you know, download it immediately. The infographic that I've just shared with you is this one here. And it's all about practice and retrieval, which I'm going to talk about extensively this evening in the context of GCSE P theory. And it's a lot of information, a lot of guidance, which is really going to bring you to the nub of what really sharp practice and retrieval looks like in any classroom. Of course, what we're going to do tonight is we're going to establish this within GC GCSE P theory teaching. So I'd really, really encourage you to go and down, download that. And guys, can I make a plea for you, from you, sorry. Can I urge you to share that infographic as widely as possible? We, we think it's about as good as you can get on um, sort of educationally speaking on, on practice and retrieval and how to sort of ingrain, uh, how to ingrain learning, how to encode learning into the long-term memory and really, really kind of provoke good quality active recall in students please reference that, get it into a tab, share it with people at your school, share it with your community. It's, it's completely free, it's available, and hopefully it's gonna do a good job for people. But with that in mind, what I kind of wanna focus on today is I'm really gonna focus on two things and sort of spice it up at the end with a third. Okay, so thing number one with regard to GCSEP theory this evening is I wanna go really in hard with regard to how we cause the encoding 
of information in the long-term memory of students in our GCSEP theory classes. We are going to talk about practice and retrieval, what that should look like, and what we can do to support that process in learners. It's absolutely essential, in my opinion, at creating and establishing and structuring a really effective GCSEP theory course. There's no reason why you can't apply it to your A-level, to your B-Tech, of course, those principles as well, but we'll talk quite a lot about examples from GCSE this evening. Secondly, I'm going to talk briefly this evening about the concept of interleaving. Again, some of you have done a little bit of that with me in recent weeks. I'm just going to touch on it this evening. And then at the end of this show, which should be in total about 45 minutes, at the end of this webinar, I'm going to introduce to you really the meat of what session two is going to be all about. And I'm really looking forward to that. I think it's quite provocative. I think it's going to generate a lot of questions. And I urge you to stick around to the end to actually get to look at that. What I'm going to show at the end is something we've been working on for quite a long time here at the Everlearner, and it's something that I think is, is partly provocative, partly supportive, but it's certainly going to lead to lots of conversation and questions. So with that in mind, and just checking whether there's any chat questions, I should say, uh, I'm on my own this evening. Uh, Mike's not working tonight, not, neither should he, it's out of hours. Uh, and Marta is, um, she's at uh, our younger daughter's school play, they're doing Bugsy Malone, and she's watching that, so hence can't be here. So um, you might find your chat questions maybe just answer slightly slower because it's being done directly by me. So as long as you can be patient with me, that's great. But with all that assumed, with all that understood, I immediately want to throw you, once I press the right button, I immediately want to throw you over to the canvas, okay? So we are interested here, we are interested here in how can we get the best quality practice and retrieval in GCSE PE theory. Now again, those of you that have done the practice and retrieval webinar with us, this will be reasonably familiar, but it's absolutely essential that we get this clear. Now then, we are talking about the tendency to promote remembering and the tendency to prevent forgetting. Now, whether that remembering is application, is knowledge and understanding, is evaluation or, or analytical skills, I'll come back to towards the end of this. But these are key principles that I want to get across to you in, these, in this scenario. So this curve here, ever so quickly, you've got it on the infographic as well, is called the Ebbinghaus the Ebbing, that's a you believe it or not, the Ebbinghaus forgetting curve. Okay, the Ebbinghaus forgetting curve. And it tells us something really, really fascinating. It tells us this, that when students initially learn something, this yellow point here, look, first learning, depending on how meaningful that learning is, so depending on how meaningful that learning is, that learning is going to reduce by almost 50% in 20 minutes. So in 20 minutes, what has been learned potentially can dissipate from the minds of our students in 20 minutes, okay? So 50% potentially, or almost 50% in 20 minutes. Now, that should come across to us as kind of a shocking statistic. And we've got to start asking questions, well, how can we change that? How can we influence that? In GCSEP theory, what are the things that cause this to be more likely and less likely? Okay, so let me come back to this word first of all, okay? The notion of big things being meaningful. When Ebbinghaus did this particular piece of research, he specifically measured the dissipation and forgetting of meaningless information. And he established that if learning was made, made more meaningful, it was, um, it was well-founded, it was applied, uh, the, the, it, it was uh, the context of how and why the students were, were understanding that, was it leading, uh, for example, to performance improvements, to specific practical performance applications, it makes things more meaningful. So what we can say, first of all, is that perhaps we can, sh and I'm just sketching here, I'm only guessing numbers, Perhaps we can shallow this curve out by making learning more meaningful. So let's, let's sort of identify a couple of culprits. Let's think about something like learning, learning, that's an I in there, believe it or not, learning a definition in isolation. Okay, so we might ask our students to learn a definition in isolation to what the application or what that principle really is used for. That is likely to decrease how meaningful that learning is and increase the tendency for that to be forgotten. 
Okay, so something like definitions for definition's sake out of context, something like teaching a concept without it being based in an application, a performance application. We have a bit of a saying here at Tell, which is no explanation without application. So just to be clear on that, if we teach something such as, I don't know, we teach about blood pressure, say, or we teach about um, abduction, say, that will never, ever be taught outside of an application setting. If we look at uh, short-term responses to exercise, that will be so absolutely fixed and solidly based within the context of, say, the first 10 minutes of a triathlon race, for example, and what a performer might experience within that context. So interesting principle, no, ex no explanation without application. Why? Because it makes learning more meaningful. Secondly, perhaps the most important point of all, we can make a pretty strong argument that let's assume we've made our learning meaningful. Let's assume that we're shallowing this curve out. But what we can be confident in is that at one day and later at 30 days, you know, this, this, um, this here is 30 days, look at, at this point, we can expect a majority loss, which sounds something like something one of our recent governments would do. Um, but a majority loss. And what, what I mean by that is over the course of something like 30 days, we should anticipate that if material is not practiced and reviewed in a, in a robust way that's well supported, we've got to expect that something like 70% of that material will be lost. Now, that as a statistic is quite concerning. Now, what I would throw out to people in the, in the session tonight is, is that, our, is that our experience? Um, do we find that we teach something in September which is dissipated and been lost by the end of October, say? Is that our experience? In what ways are we trying to challenge that? In what ways are we trying to bring out a different behavior or a different level of memorization and encoding of that information with students? What successes have you guys found? Obviously, I can talk about mine, but what successes have people had? I think that's an interesting question. But what Ebbinghaus has shown us really clearly is that learning especially if it's less meaningful, dissipates very, very rapidly if it's not used, okay? So, so let's have a bit more of a think about this. Now, what Ebbinghaus also introduced us to is this curve here, and this is what we call the forgetting cycle. I should say, actually, guys, I should say, you can download any of these images that I'm using that you may wish to. I'll put them into the chat for you now. Bear with me a second. All of the images that I'm using within this session, including the infographic, actually, are available here. Okay, so let me just put images link. There you go. All the images for the session are available there for you. Okay, so you can go and download and use any of these images that we've got in the show. But let me just go back to the canvas a second. So let's have a think about this. Ebbinghaus introduced this notion of the forgetting curve. And what I really want to draw your attention to here is the following. Look, we know the profile of this forgetting. We have just looked at it with regard to Ebbinghaus's forgetting. In our GCSE PE classes, we can expect our students to forget things if they're not revisited, practiced, and reviewed. But what if we do practice them? Okay, well, this is what happens. When we first learn something over here, the time it takes to forget 20% of that material is what we call T or 1T. If we practice it once, the tendency to forget or the time it takes to forget multiplies by two. Now, that's a really interesting factor. We can directly apply that to our GCSE P theory classes, to our homeworks, to our practice structures. Now, I'm sure many of you already do. We don't just teach them something and wish them luck. We have them use it practice it, work on it, review it, come back to it. But how is that formulated over time is my question. Again, after second use of the information, the student will have gradually forget this, twice as long it will take. It will take. If they review it again, the time taken to forget is now three times longer than the initial forgetting. Now, what does this mean for us as GCSEP theory teachers? Well, it means that we need, in my opinion, to structure, practice, and review, okay? So yes, we do our jobs in the class. Yes, we deliver information to the best of our capacity. Yes, we guide our students as best as we can towards homeworks and those sort of things. But we have to acknowledge how human beings actually learn and forget 
And we have to make sure that there is structured practice review, practice and or review, which means that this knowledge remains alive in the mind of the student. And I want to introduce you to something provocative and ask you a question. So from what I have just said, if we're taking the average GCSE PE theory class, which no doubt does not exist anywhere, but let's just, uh, let's just imagine that place. The worst thing from what I've just said we could see would be the following. It would be learn something, move on and don't come back to it. Learn something else, move on and don't come back to it. That is going to create, without question, an experience of forgetting. That is what that structure is going to create. Now, of course, I realize that everybody in here is doing it way, way, way better than that. I'm just trying to look at that notion of worst. Okay. What then is the best case? Well, let's have a look. We are arguing, and there is, by the way, I should just reference Rose and Shine here because although I'm not going to talk about Rose and Shine's work, the principles of instruction, they're quite important to what's written here, actually. If you're interested in finding out more about Rose and Shine, have a look at the, um, the infographic, have a look at the, uh, the full session I did on practice retrieval. You can also go and have a look at Tom, um, um, I've forgotten his name. <laughs> what's the, what's at teacher head on Twitter? I can't remember his, uh, Tom Sherrington. You can go and have a look, sorry, Tom. Uh, you can go and have a look at Tom Sherrington's recent book on Rosenstein's principle in, Principles of Instruction. But one of the critical points, and I would really encourage some reflection of how you think this can be applied, Rosenstein and the research we just saw there from Ebbinghaus suggests that the ideal structure for maintaining memory of learning is daily review, weekly review, and monthly review of that which has been learned. I'm just gonna say that again. In an ideal scenario, which you probably don't have, daily review, as a minimum, daily review, weekly review, monthly review of that which has come before. So if something's learned here on day one, we, wanna, we actually want to practice it here. We want to practice it seven days later, and we want to practice it 30 days later, okay? Daily, weekly, monthly. All right, and of course, probably interspersed with other things, right? Okay, we'll talk about the practicalities of this in a second. Secondly, review also means that teaching is repeatable. Can a student take a teaching episode more than once? Now, it's very hard for classroom teachers, for people in, in that sort of physical classroom environment to scale themselves and make their teaching available more than it already is. And thirdly, practice and review continuously available. And finally, practice at practice and review both agile and individualized. In other words, can we get more students reviewing the things they need to review most more often? Now, that's my challenge to you. Now, the question is, how is that practical? How do you do that? I mean, how do you actually go about that? So first things first, there's a couple of limitations, right? You guys, you're probably seeing your GCSE class something between one and three times a week. Some of you are going to be shocked at the number three I just said. You're going, to be seeing your, you're going to be seeing your students some, a couple of times a week, something like that. And you might be thinking, well, you know, I teach them on this day and I teach them on this day. How can I do a daily review? Okay. Could you switch that and make that an individual lesson review? That something like 48 hours after a lesson happens, there's some kind of activity that the student has to engage in, which quickly and sharply reviews that which has just been done. Can that be introduced a week after that? Can that be introduced 30 days after that and can we develop a cycle of that with students because the research would suggest that if we do that the tendency for them to remember will dramatically increase and the tendency to, to forget will dramatically decrease and of course from that you get a tendency for students to learn the next things better and better and better why because what they've learned is more fixed it's more established it's 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 embedded in that long-term memory and the active recall of it is sharper now, again, can I urge you to have a look back at that infographic, which I shared right at the start, that really summarizes those processes. Now, I'm not going to talk this evening about Thalheimer, who actually is one of my, the theories that I like best to apply to GCSEPE. <coughs> that one's about reactivation curve, implementing practice scenarios after the formal learning is finished. Um, but that infographic will get a lot of that work done for you. So there's my challenge to you. I'm throwing that out. Can we collectively in our GCSEP theory classes, can we say, right, the research suggests that immediate review, call it daily, call it lesson, 
immediate review, seven day review, 30 day review, influences how students perform, influences what students can remember. Can we actually implement that? Now, I'm very open to receive any questions or points in the chat. Uh, I'm gonna show you a couple of bits and bobs uh, that would be suggestions from me. Um, but I'm really intrigued to see what people think about that. Is that provocative? Is it new? Am I saying things that are completely unrealistic? Um, am I massively increasing your workload? What is it that kind of comes up in the mind when I suggest these, uh, these points to you? One thing we can be confident on is they're founded, they're well-founded. Okay, so the question therefore is, can we implement them? Question or a point here. Uh, Javier Martin, uh, time. Uh, what did you mean by that, Javier, please? In, in finding the time to do it, I'm assuming you mean with that one. Uh, I'll, I'll hopefully give you a bit of an answer to that in just a few moments time, but I'm assuming that's what you mean. Uh, yeah, so look, let me be clear. I am absolutely not suggesting that you set three times as much work to do three times as much preparation materials, three times as much marking and three times as much collating for you guys to do. No. That is not going to work, okay? Because anything which is manual and analog like that, what we're talking about here is simply going to increase what you're already doing. We have to find smarter ways of doing that, okay? We have to find sharp ways. What about if I said back to you, right, I think we can implement it and I think we can reduce your workload from what it is now, okay? Well, there's a bold claim for me. Let's see if we can actually go about doing it. So let me... Uh, just bear with me a second, folks. I'm on the wrong tab. Let me introduce you to this. Okay, let me introduce you to this. So I'm on the everlearner.com here. Uh, we have your course, in case that is a question on your mind. I'm logged in here as a student, Draco Malfoy. He's at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. He's a talented yet troubled young man. Um, and look, I'm going to show you two things with regard to Draco. Just, rem just remind you what I said, we wanna get, can we get some notion of daily? Can we get some notion of weekly? Can we get some notion of monthly review of that which has been learned so it can be practiced and reviewed? I think we can. So let's have a look what Draco's got here and I'll give you a bit of context. Look, here, Draco has been set a daily review, movement patterns and planes. So he's just learned movement patterns and planes. Okay, good. And he's got 21 hours left here. He's got 21 hours left before he has to complete that. If we click into that, this is what he actually has to do. He has to do eight questions. His teacher McGonagall is asking him to get 80% and repeat until he gets that. Don't give up until you get that. And if you're stuck or struggling, go back to practice mode and go back to the tutorial. In case you don't know what the context of that is, I'll just go to a different tab here. Draco, by the way, this is for Edexcel, GCSEPE. I mean, this could be AQA, OCR, IGCSE. It, you know, I'm just happy to choose Edexcel here. So let's just have a look at this, guys, okay? So in, the, on, in here, so Draco's got his entire course laid out, laid out for him here. Draco has got movement patterns, and he's got some options. That's one of the things he might need to go back and review. Draco can go, go back into that, and inside this tutorial, you see it's actually part of an open assignment for him. He's actually got a tutorial here, which is going to teach him all of the material related to that principle. Let me take my headphones off so you can actually hear that second. Hello there, this is James at myPexam.org. What we're going to do is see how this point. Now we have different movements that which involve... I'm just going to flick through here. Flexion. Plantar flexion is a form of... Uh, so I'll just come out of the tutorial there, but the point with that is Draco can go and retake teaching. He can also go into movement patterns and take practice test, uh, practice questions. No pressure. Take your time. Use your notes. Learning, not testing. He can go into here and he can get questions. I'm not reading them. He can get questions here that he can answer in relation to this particular unit that I'm talking about. Okay, so let's go for abduction on that one bit of feedback and so on. So what is what has Draco got there? He's got a tutorial which will review and reteach him. Let me just come back on here. He's to, just to be clear, he's got a tutorial which will review and reteach him. He's got practice mode quizzing, which is like low stakes quizzing. So he can use that to prepare himself for the review test that the teacher has set for him and said he has to do. So let's just assume that what Draco does is he go he logs in. He retakes a bit of the tutorial, maybe just flicks, just reminds himself, takes a few notes. He does five or six practice questions about movement patterns, maybe about planes as well. And then what does he do? He goes to his 
he goes to his assignments. So let me let me uh, let me click into assignments here. So he comes out of here. He goes to his assignments, and here on assignments, he's got this one that's 20 hours left. He goes in here. He takes this test, and he's now into questions. In this case, all about the shoulder, which I'll just put in some old guff in here. It's going to be ball and socket, isn't it? But I put that in there, and I go through, and I can start taking these questions reviewing what it was that my teacher wanted me to do from recently okay so i'm being asked which plane is this movement along okay i think it might be the frontal plane let's check and i get my feedback based on that answer so again we've got an environment here where a student can retake teaching they can do practice mode quizzing to to sharpen up and their teacher very quickly can set them little challenges which are like do eight questions, do 12 questions, and they can time them and space them out as suits the environment that the teacher has decided to set up. Let's just go back on with Draco here a second. If we just go back to assignments for Draco. So Draco, if we look here, he's been set this assignment. It's sort of immediate, do it now. And it's reviewing, daily review, movement patterns and planes. Eight questions, remember, inside that one. Opening in one day, let's call it the end of the week, Okay, he's got his weekly review. Okay, so this is not open yet, but in weekly review, look, this time he's been set 12 questions. He's been asked to get the same standard, 80%, and this is what the lessons are gonna include. So he's gonna do some movement patterns, joint features, muscle locations, uh, pairs of muscles and planes, okay? And it says here, again, if stuck, go back to practice mode and return to the tutorials. So again, let me be super clear about what I've just shown you. Your student has still had their class with you. You've taught them, it's been amazing. You've taught them beautifully. Uh, you've done a wonderful worksheet. You've done some pair work. They've done a past paper question, whatever it happens to be in your particular lesson. But as a follow-up, you've set them an assignment, and that assignment, which by the way, they take about 30 seconds to set. It's, it's set the material for them, it's notified them, it's marking the work for them and it's delivering it back to you as the teacher without you lifting a finger, including in your assignment mark book. So coming back to Javier's question, does this increase time? It depends how you do it. The way I've just shown you it, if you consider that to be part of your homework strategy, it will actually decrease the time because it removes all the need for marking. It removes the need for notifying students. It removes the need for creating the material in the first place. So that is one way you've got to do it. Look, you by all means can create a million bits of paper, print them out and give them out to your students and then mark them all. Of course, if that's your way, do it. But I'm arguing that in 2019, there's a better way. And of course, it can also lead to much greater levels of insight, diagnostics, the teacher can understand how their students are performing in any particular moment in time. It's also something, it's one thing setting a piece of review work for students. What if, what if someone isn't doing very well on that review? What if they have forgotten? Have you got that course agility to send them back to something which is going to effectively reteach them, reintroduce them, review it all for them? And that's what the Ever Learner really is. Okay, so I wanted to show you. Uh, I wanted to show you that example. So, guys, I can't stress enough: practice and retrieval. What is our key message? There? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Sound like I'm doing some kind of campaign. What's my key message on that one? My my key message really on that one is look. Do what you're doing in the classroom, of course. Make it meaningful. Uh, review in the classroom with the work that you do, of course. But once, once we've got that learning done, you know, whatever lesson one is, whatever lesson two is, we've got to give students an opportunity to come back and practice and review that over time. Because if we do not, the evidence is absolutely robustly clear, they will forget it. Okay, maybe not all of it. Some of it will remain, maybe not all students but there's gonna be a significant amount of forgetting. Okay, good. A um, Couple of other principles. I wanna again, share a link with you guys. I just wanna briefly talk to you about the concept of interleaving, okay? So I'm gonna first of all, uh, post a link into the chat. Uh, okay, so uh, let me answer this question. This is from Aaron. Hi, Aaron, thank you very much for your questions. Appreciate it. So at what depth at 30 days? A checkpoint set or an additional lesson on the topic or checkpoint and focus on a six nine mark in the lesson. So first of all, I, I'll sort of answer that backwards. I would say focusing on a six nine mark, I personally wouldn't consider review. Now, you don't have to agree, but that would be my view. I, I would consider that to be a different kind of process. I mean, I still think 
that that would be very instructive in the sense that you would be developing out from them, let's say, evaluative um, knowledge and behavior. Okay, so for me, I wouldn't consider something like a, a, a past paper question loosely what you would call a, a review cycle. Um, in terms of the checkpoint there, absolutely great to use checkpoints. They're wonderful tools to use. My only suggestion to that would be, of course, the checkpoints are effectively uh, preset by us in terms of what's in them. Okay, now, of course, if you're at that point, that's great. But don't forget in terms of setting the assignments and selecting the test elements that you want in those, in those tests yourself, you can effectively make your own checkpoint in that sense. In terms of depth, I think the key for me on that one and everything I've read about forgetting is what the students need most is what they call active recall. Okay, and active recall from everything I've understood and everything I've read is about using the key when it comes to uh, situations where people are ultimately going to write something in their assessment, which of course the P theory exam is. Okay, they might draw something, I suppose, but they're going to write something. Everything that I've read suggested that the key practice and review is with the key subject terminology. So you want a depth which is forcing the student in some kind of pressure to recall that key subject terminology. So something like a checkpoint, something like quizzing is ideal for that. Now, of course, they're then, you know, if you're then going to do a, a timed nine marker, for example, they're going to utilize that. And remember, we're not saying one or the other. You could use something like a quiz structure, a worksheet sh structure to then build to something like a piece of writing. Okay, and thank you for the question, Aaron. I really appreciate that. Um, right, let me shift our focus a little bit to interleave. I'm not going to spend very long on this. But I just want to kind of introduce it to those of you that don't know it and reintroduce it to those of you that do. The key thing with interleaving, the key thing you want to be considering is it's very good in PE for developing application. So we all, are, we all know our AO2s. We all know that some students struggle with it, some students do it better, some students do it worse, some students really struggle to get their knowledge and understanding and apply it to some kind of performance or performance improvement. Interleaving is a really nice tool for developing application skills. Why? Because it develops context. Interleaving really is a, pro a, protest, a process of developing context in the learning that students are making. So let's just quickly make a comparison, which by itself, is a strong feature of interleaving. The main idea is, is this, is that most things at the moment in classrooms are taught in what you would call a one, a one thing at a time model, okay? So what we mean by that is that um, a block of something will be taught in lesson one, a block of something else will be taught in lesson two, a block of something else will be taught in lesson three. So what would be examples of that? Well, let me just choose some random stuff. We might, in lesson one, choose, uh, we, we teach and encourage the location of bones. In lesson two, we might do types of bones. In lesson three, we might do um, movement patterns or we might do joint features or something like that, okay? We basically block things up. We literally call this blocking or block teaching. This is what this is referred to, okay? So learning in blocks. And this here is perhaps what this would look like. So maybe we can assume here that all of these A's this is all of our learning or all of our teaching to do with, let's say, location of bones. You know, we teach it, they do some kind of worksheet labeling something, and they do a practice question, okay? Then perhaps what we've got here is they learn about types of bones, they do a practice on types of bones, they do a question on, on types of bones here, they learn about, let's say, uh, joint features, they practice joint features, they do a question on joint features. Now, that, was, that is probably the dominant way that people present their GCSE classes, I would argue, today. Now, I'm very open to someone disagreeing with that and, and telling me I'm wrong. I would love to hear that. That would be great. But I feel probably that is approximately what's happening in, let's, what, let's loosely call that classroom that doesn't exist, the average GCSE P theory classroom. I think that's approximately what's happening. Um, again, do, do let me know if you disagree. I, I genuinely would be interested to hear that. Um, what interleaving suggests is something different. It says you study a few things at a time, which sounds a bit dangerous when you first hear it, right? Oh, I don't like the sound of that. It argues you can mix different topics and skills, and this is called interleaving. So let's just remind ourselves of the examples that I just made. I said the three things in our first three lessons were location of bones. Uh, what did I say? I said types of bones, and I said uh, joint features. 
Okay, I don't think that relates to any single GCSE course actually, but anyway, they're the ones I said, so I'll stick with it. Obviously, whatever the, whatever the little block of three of you can be specific to what you're thinking about. What interleaving would suggest is that we would take these three pieces of learning and effectively we would learn them together. Okay, so let's just call this the learning. Maybe this is you instructing, teaching them. It would also suggest to us that here, let's just call this the P. We would practice them together. Our resources, our worksheets, the things we provide students to actually engage them in this material is not distinct and separate, but instead includes elements of these things here. And thirdly, let's loosely call this T. I'm not meaning to break lessons down in a learning episode, a practice episode, and a testing episode, by the way. I know there's loads more diversity than that. Um, and what we're saying here is that when we come test, let's think about a past paper question or we do, we do a series of four and four, uh, three, four and five markers, for example. The point is here that when the student opens that paper and that task, they could well have questions about location of bones, about types of bones and about joint features together on the same paper. Now, what's really interesting about this, and I won't read it out um, as it were now on A, if you want to get more details of this, go back to the interleaving recording we did last week. But what's really interesting is that if you take the practice element of this, even if you don't change anything else, just the worksheets and the things that students would do in class, if you interleave different topics together, one study showed that after 30 days, that after 30 days, students will retain 74 percent more than non-interleaved practice. I'm just going to say that again. Okay, so if we interleave, if we do, so instead of breaking everything into its chunk and separating, separating it, which I think everyone would agree, sort of, it sort of belies these topics, right? I mean, they are linked. Okay, so location of bones and types of bones, I mean, they are intrinsically linked to one another. You know, long bones being in the appendicular skeleton and being located, I don't know whether the humerus or the femur or the tibia are, say, there's a reason for that, okay? So what, this, what the study I'm referencing here, and again, go to the interleaving session I put in the chat, you get all the details in this. They literally found that 74% more retained doing interleave practice. So even if you teach in exactly the same way, block, 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 the practice and the testing, if things are interleaved together, more than one thing at a time, you can get dramatically better performance out of students. Now, I personally think that is quite exciting. I'm trying to do some kind of exclamation marks. I can't do some kind of big explosive circle. Okay, I think that's really exciting. So the question then remains before we sort of wrap this little bit up is what can you interleave? Now, I'm, I wanna be specifically, specific here. I'm talking about in GCSE PE theory. Okay, I'm not going to get into longer conversations about more broad interleaving. Okay, so what can you interleave? Different inverted commas topics. Can I stress to you, I do not in any way encourage anyone to interleave commercialization of sport and movement patterns. It's ridiculous. Why would you? It doesn't, they are not associated. Don't do it. Well, and probably in your course, there are a different exam. But anyway, regardless of that, it's ridiculous. Don't do it. By the way, I heard, I'm slightly worried about the person who told me this might be in this call. I'm going to check. Um, no, I don't think so. Someone told me recently that their school had applied into leaving across the entire school. And every department manager had been told that what you have to do is take the first lesson out of every chapter on your course and put them together. So you ended up with completely abstract combinations of things that you had to sort of teach together. That is not what interleaving is. It's about finding those areas of theory, ideas, concepts, where they actually kind of associate with one another and link. Now, it's not you know, teaching the, the heart and the blood vessels, very common to us to do that together, right? What about teaching the blood vessels and the blood? That, that Again, those are really well established. What about teaching features of the, of the respiratory system and the cardiovascular system more intertwined? That kind of makes sense, right? I mean, they are united systems. I mean, they are literally an organ system bit of GCSE biology there in case anyone else teaches it. Um, so we can interleave different topics. The other thing, and you've already seen examples of this, we can interleave old and new learning. Think about things like your seven day review. 
Think about things like your 30 day review. You know, we can effectively interleave old and new learning, bringing the old back. We can interleave what we call, I made this term up by the way, blocks and leaves. And what we mean by blocks and leaves is by all means teach in blocks, but simply do the practice as interleaved. Okay, so rather than, you know, and it is a problem, right? If you do, let's take the location of bones one. If you do, um, if you teach location of bones, they do a worksheet on location of bones and then you give them a pass paper question, guess what it's going to be about? They know it's going to be about location of bones or whatever it is that you're doing that day. Whereas if, if the practice and the sort of the challenges are interspersed with other material, that makes a very, very different experience. You have to really interpret and analyze that much more closely. And this one I'm going to touch on right at the end of today. Can we, inter and do we want to, interleave different skills and assessment objectives? Now, this is where really I'm going to throw a lot of this back to you because I'm kind of fascinated to see what you think, okay? Would we, say for example, would we, for example, interleave something like knowledge and understanding, which is what I've tried to write there, and application? I think we would. You know, we'd say, in the example I gave before, instead of saying, um, uh, instead of saying the short-term responses to exercise are, and then sometime later saying, right, uh, you could apply this to a triathlete, could we teach from scratch saying, look, let's take a triathlete, okay, their event's going to be so and so, an hour, and, uh, two hours long, okay, but let's have a think about those first five minutes, what would we anticipate? Well, this is what we'd anticipate. The triathlete, the triathlete will experience the following. This is the impact on the triathlete. We'd even bring in that evaluation and that sort of analytical skill in there as well. So can we interleave, and do you want to interleave, the actual knowledge and understanding, and then those other AOs, the application, and the, um, the AO3 is the evaluative and analytical skills. Now, I personally do that all the time but I know some people really like to separate that stuff out and do that almost in blocks of skills I think it's a fascinating question to to pose what would be uh, what would be the right thing for people to do so interleaving is that concept again if you want to look at more details on it go and have a look in that last chat I posted there uh, which was um, the interleaving uh, did I post the interleaving session I thought I did. If I didn't, let me just let me just post it again in case I didn't. So it's the interleaving uh, full session that you guys can can go and take at your own speed. Now, so that's there. So it's a full sort of forty-five minute session. Now I'm going to leave you once you guys ask any questions or let me know. And Jill, I, Jill, I only just noticed I feel a bit embarrassed. Jill Rastel, no, she raised a hand. I don't know why. So Jill, forgive me if I've been rude and ignoring you. I, as I said at the start, I'm kind of on my own uh, this evening. So. I managed to miss that, sorry. Do, do let me know, pop it in the chat or pop a question and I'll, I'll answer it as, as best I can for you. Um, what, I do wanna, what I do wanna post to you, and guys, this is gonna be really where we go on session two. I wanna pose this big question, okay? And at Tell, at the Everlearner, we've been working on this concept for quite a long time now. Um, we're intrigued to see what people make of it and we're intrigued to see what impressions it makes on people. And all I'm doing here is posing a question. I'm not advocating at this point. I am not telling or instructing you. It's just conversations that we're, av we're having within our offices. So what have we got here? Well, basically what we've got is that up here, this here is AO1, okay? This down here is AO2. And this down here is AO3. So basically the point is that, is that this circle here represents all that knowledge and understanding that the students are gonna be required to have for their GCSEP theory exams or exam, depending on your course. Okay, now the point I wanna to stress to you, I think, although it's slightly provocative, that I'm arguing, and this is really where we're gonna go in session two. And I really, I mean, we've got a really big reveal in session two. I really urge you to be there because we are gonna launch something which I think is arguably our, some of our best ever work. I say that quite often, quite like the roadmap as well, if I'm honest, I think that's pretty cool. Um, but anyway, the point is, if we learn knowledge and understanding in isolation, which I guess is this part here, right? This part here, okay, knowledge and understanding in isolation. The point I'm gonna make here, or at least the conversation I want to begin is, are, can we argue that that learning is superficial? Okay, now we've sort of labeled it this way. 
If we combine it with learning, which is well based in practical, uh, practical application, performance improvement, this sort of thing, would that make this space more utilizable? Or if we take knowledge and understanding and we learn it in the context of analytical skills, perhaps gra graphical analysis, perhaps evaluative skills, can we argue that that is more utilizable? And finally, can we define I meant, I meant to do that in a different color. Can we define, let me choose some green, can we define this area here as somehow depicting full understanding? And if we can, how do we get students there and what are the implications? Now, the reason that I've posed this is because my feeling and my interpretation is, and my observation is, that I think what we do is, sorry, I'm going to rephrase that. That's not fair. I think what happens a lot in the average GCSE PE classroom, please let me know if you disagree, um, is I think that we have a lot of tendency to be delivering and expecting this. Then we kind of chunk on top this. And maybe we also chunk on top this. Perhaps without, I've made a right mess, perhaps without seeing the integrations and the synopticity across those things. And what I want to do in session two is uncover a whole series of activities, behaviors, challenges, uh, classroom practices, homework practices, homework strategies that I feel take people from approximately here to here, from approximately here to basically from the outside in so that students have a much fuller and more complete understanding. And I'll make a prediction for you. I am pretty confident that when we get our um, examiner's reports and things back at the end of this particular academic year, I think that one of the things that we're gonna find is that things like application have not been done well. I'm working quite closely um, with some examining at the moment, and I won't say which board, I won't say what for, um, but it's becoming really clear that knowledge and understanding is okay, People have a go at evaluation and analysis, and people have a go at application, but the connection between the three is really weak. And that's something I'd really like to explore in the session that we do on session two. And I should say, by the way, guys, do go and sign up to session two. This is the link, oops, that's not what I wanted to click. This is the link to session two, guys. Go and sign up for it if you're not already. We've got a massive reveal in that session. So go and have a little click on that. And, um, and come and join us for that session too. So I'm gonna pause there, I'm gonna drink my water. Uh, what time has passed and is passing, but I do wanna give people a bit of a chance to, uh, to ask questions. By the way, guys, I don't know if you ever wonder this, but uh, as you consider asking me a questions, question, this is how we actually uh, write directly onto, uh, onto the, onto the uh, canvas. So if I just click on the canvas app, I'll show you, we actually write directly onto this, onto this with the pen, just thought, just thought I'd show you, just in case anyone ever wondered. So, any questions from you guys before we wrap up? Uh, from Lee, thanks James, have a good evening. I am gonna have a good evening, I'll tell you why. I have a beautiful, well, um, how yeah, it's actually a Priorat that I've got at home, and I'm gonna be having a glass of that later on. I wonder if Javier knows uh, Priorat wine uh, from the pen of this. I'm a bit of a, I do, I do like a really nice wine. Okay, so we got from Natasha. Let me read this out. I've just started teaching GCCP again this year and over the year I've been developing the students' ability to apply their knowledge and evaluate almost every lesson plus apply to practical lessons. This is what we're going to talk about in session two. Tasha, whatever happens, don't stop doing that. The fact that you've just started, look, Tasha, I, I don't know how experienced you are in sort of teaching general, but if you've just started doing GCSE PE and that, is the, that, that is the approach you're taking. You are hitting a lot of the marks, bang on the, bang on the, what's the top of the nail called? You know what I mean? Right on, square on the nail. Perfect. The only thing I'd challenge you on, you may be doing it, I don't know, but just think about that practice and review work we did towards the start of the session. Could that have implications for you? Have a think about that, but good for you and thank you for sharing. That's exactly what I would argue we want to see. Now, we could look at it from the other side. I know, for example, that AQA tell their centers, uh, do AO1, do AO2, do AO3, in things like the extended writing. 
can you learn that way? I, um, maybe you can write that way. I'm not sure. But can you learn that way? Can you truly understand something in that way? It's an interesting one. Uh, from Natasha, it's still a work in practice. And I'm also trying to fit learning uh, for the knowledge and understanding so the application happens in lesson where I Well, look, I mean, you, we're singing from the same hymn sheet. I mean, for me, Natasha, I happily talk to you about this in more detail. I don't do any from the front teaching in, in lesson time at all. Um, which would really shock someone like, uh, what's his name? Tom Bennett, who wants us all to stand at the front and direct everybody. Um, but yeah, I mean, I agree. I mean, less than time for usage of it material. I mean, that's one of the things, right? Isn't that why flip learning is potentially successful? Because it brings the review and the practice closer to the teacher rather than being set for homework typically. I think that's one of the great beauties of flip learning. So again, I, I couldn't agree more with you on that. Um, I also have a review at the start of every lesson with application to exam questions and base a lot of this on the marking I've completed. Perfect. A couple of observations, obviously, just um, interpreting from what you've written there. So if you, if you look at Rosenshine's principles, I mean, it obviously it fits quite neatly into the notion of a starter in a lesson. Rosenshine argues very, very coherently and clearly that every lesson should start with a review of what's gone before. How you do that, if you quickly reteach something, you use a Kagan structures like a rally robin, or you, you do a question, put them on the board. I guess that's up to you. I'm in lesson start review i'm not a big fan of like looseness you know of, of, of things being kind of voluntary I, I really want to sort of get to the heart of things um the other thing i'd say with what you wrote there um so you're looking for big picture across the writing that they've been doing and then you're reviewing collectively is that and look, i'm only throwing this out as provocation because you very kindly offered some really interesting words there is there any way of making that really really individualized that would be my kind of provocative thought for you if you want to discuss that i have a lot of ideas on that if you want to discuss that perhaps outside of this environment um we can discuss that and uh, we can go from there so folks uh, i should wish you a beautiful evening i am going to go and enjoy a really beautiful a uh, glass of red wine. Uh, Tasha, great discussion. Let's do it when, whenever you're ready. I mean, but my email, by the way, is james at the ever, james at the ever learner dot com. Tasha, get in touch, okay? Um, and we, we, whenever, whenever shoot you, I'm available, okay? Um, so, muchas uh, gracias a tu, Javier. Um, como siempre, um, ¿dónde es tu? No recuerdo, ¿eh? ¿Es de Barcelona o de Oh, oh, not not recuerdo. Uh, hasta, hasta luego, Tasha. Good effort, but wrong. Uh, La Tortosa, Tarragona. I've never visited Tarragona. Tasha, great effort. Hasta luego is in Castilian Spanish. Uh, Javier and I are speaking Catalan. Uh, so if I'm a British guy, but uh, Catalan people feel very very strongly about these things. So uh, <laughs> Tasha, don't feel bad. Yeah, okay, Terra Alta. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah, well, uh, so you're just north of the Delta, is that right, Javier? No, that's right. Delta. Uh, yeah, you're just north of the dump there, aren't you? Okay, cool. Well, look, um, Catalonia's in my heart. I'll tell you guys a bit of a secret. Catal Catalonia's in my heart, and Javier, I don't know about you, Catalonia's also in my future. At, what, at some point in my life, that's where I want to spend my great, geez, I mean, it's already really, but my graying years, I hope, to be there. My favorite place, by the way, um, Javier, is uh, Las Cabanas. I don't know if you know the, the mountain, uh, the Massis uh, between Girona and Palamos. Yeah. Good seafood, good mountain air, beautiful weather, and a beautiful medieval city in Giovanna. This is where my heart is, and one day, one day, one day, one day, we will be there. Guys, thanks so much. Have a great one, okay? All the best. Take care.